Hi, Len. Oh, hi there. <laughs> so, so before we uh, start talking about Stephen Hawking, I think I've, I've given a brief biography of yourself. Can you tell a little bit about, uh, about your life and, and how you first met Stephen Hawking? Well, I'll tell you how I first, first met Stephen Hawking, and then I'll let you ask <laughs> more details about my life. But um, uh, he read my first two books, uh, Euclid's Window, which was about curved space, what it means, how it's used in physics, and how it, uh, it, it developed from geometry over the centuries. And the second book was called Feynman's Rainbow, or in England, Sometime with Feynman, which was accurate. It was Sometime with Feynman. It was about when I was a young faculty member at Caltech and my interactions with the great, iconic, brilliant, genius physicist who was my idol, Richard Feynman, uh, and about how he helped me find, uh, realize how that I should follow my passions in life. A very good bookend to this book because Stephen had a similar influence uh, on me, a similar profound, profound influence on me. Anyway, he was looking apparently for somebody back then to write with him because it's so hard for him to communicate uh, himself and he wanted someone from what I heard later with a sense of humor who, whose writing he liked but also someone who knew physics and of course that that letter that lab the former one there's plenty the latter one that narrows it down a bit and uh, so he read those two books and one day I just got a call from my agent and she said uh, hey uh, this might not happen but but you know if it's if it works out would you like to write a book with Stephen Hawking <laughs> <laughs> I said, you have to ask? Yeah, I mean, I was really honored and floored by that. And um, and that was amazing. So that, that that was our first book that we ended up writing called A Briefer History of Time, which was really a updated version of A Brief History of Time. Stephen knew that although it sold more than 10 million copies, uh, most people hadn't read A Brief History of Time or, or at least understood all of it or had read all of it. Uh, in fact, he had, uh, you know, in his, uh, in his voice system, he had he would normally have to painstakingly type out his comments, but he had a few canned phrases. And one of them was like, have you read the book? Because he's had, he told so many times, I love the brief history of time. Uh, have you read it to the end? Because he felt that most people did it. So we rewrote it in a way that, that, that I think was, was clearer. It, it, it's really very close to the original, but it's clearer. And um, it was after that, uh, that came out and that, that was a great experience working with him. We didn't actually have to, be with each other that much because we are working from the existing book. Uh, but then I had this idea that his latest work in the in the 2000s uh, was really fascinating. His all his other books, a brief history of time, briefer history, of course, a universe in a nutshell. That that had all been about his work in the in the 70s and 80s. But he was doing some really exciting stuff in the 2000s that I was reading about. So I was on the faculty at Caltech at that time, and uh, he would come visit for three, four weeks each year. And so the next visit uh, that he made there, uh, I went to his office and uh, proposed to him that we write another book on his latest work. And I thought that he would have to think about that for a while, but he answered as quickly as I did. So um, so I got a quick yes, although that was that was a little deceptive because we ended up talking, debating, arguing about what would be in the book for the next year and before I even started writing it. So that anyway, that's how we that's how we hooked up. Fantastic. I'd like to actually talk a little bit more about that writing process because, of course, he has to speak through the voice synthesizer and so forth. So, 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 did you do a lot of correspondence via emails? Did you do a lot of it in person, speaking to each other? How 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 did the kind of process so, work? So, for the grand design, uh, the way it would work was we would meet and talk about. Well, we had you know we went over the outline over and over and over again. And then we divided up, when we started writing, we would divide up sections into you do this, I'll do that. So we would separate and uh, each do our sections and then we would email it to each other and I would look over his and make whatever edits uh, and he would look over mine. And then we would meet uh, usually at Cambridge, but also during his uh, month long visits to Caltech. And um, I'd sit with them and we'd go, <laughs> go over word by word, literally, wow. <laughs> Maybe letter by letter sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of interesting because even though it was very tedious for him to speak and would be exhausting for me, he had to, well, at first he could move his thumb which to click a mouse and later he had to twitch his cheek, which was picked up by a sensor on his glasses. And in that way he would painstakingly choose letters to type out words 
or sometimes from a list of words because it would, there would be a list of once they had a few letters, a list of words that start with those letters and uh, to, to compose the sentences. Uh, and then he would hit another um, link to play them with his com famous computer voice. And that was about six words a minute while we were working together, either first by the thumb. And then as that deteriorated, uh, he went uh, he had a new system. And again, it went up to six words a minute. Um, so it's something that uh, I think a, most people would just be exhausted by, but uh, I don't, he never seemed to let that get in his way. Uh, he would say whatever he wanted, no matter how long it took. And he, he would, in the end of the day, if anyone was exhausted by our conversations, it was me. I have a great picture of me like laying on the floor like that. And he's <laughs> looking down and he'd be used like, well, you gotta be stronger, Leonard. <laughs> So I think uh, I'd like to rewind now and just kind of go back to the kind of start of Stephen's life. Uh, just talk about a little bit about his early time in Cambridge and his early work and and hopefully you as a physicist will be able to explain exactly what that work was and what it meant because uh, yeah unfortunately I uh, I got third in my first year physics and I've never been uh, this, this was about my limit of understanding. Uh, so so oh, not my limits of understanding too believe me. <laughs> So, so I guess he started off uh, at Cambridge where he did his PhD, um, working with Roger Penrose, who obviously many people watching will know. I mean, spoken many times at the Royal Institution and just an absolute giant of um, British British science. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about his his work that he did? I think it was, I think it was for his PhD, and then and then afterwards as well. Was that on singularity theorem? Is that right? So, what, sure. what is yeah. singularity well, theorem? Yeah, he started at Oxford, the other the other school they call it, I guess, in Cambridge. I, I don't like to talk about Oxford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, he was kind of a goof off there, uh, and he drank a lot, like the party. And Stephen was a fun-loving guy. And um, so, one thing I want to mention is that when he got sick, and I, and I spoke with him about this, about his how the impact his illness had. And this is one of the things I found most inspirational was that um, when he got sick, he he found then found meaning and purpose in his life. And I think that really improved his life uh, for, for his remaining years. So he thought it would just be a few years, but when he got sick, he realized uh, that he wanted to do something with his remaining years, and he wanted to answer those big questions of the universe that he'd been attacking his whole career, which I like to think he answered in the grand design, which is um, uh, how did it all begin? Why are the laws of nature what we are? How did we get here? You know, those questions of existence. So um, so while he, he was kind of, I mean, he was really smart, so I'm not, he, he did find at Oxford, but he didn't apply himself. And at Cambridge, after, finding this meaning and the purpose in his life, he got really serious uh, about it. And uh, those are the questions he wanted to uh, answer. And uh, he was, you know, a regular graduate student uh, starting off uh, working on whatever he, he find interesting. And when you're first at grad school, you're, you're usually a little bit lost and um, searching for the right problem, the right direction. You have a, don't really have a you know, background established in, in life. And as I said in the book, you know, I, even the most famous people later in physics uh, usually are just another grad student when they're starting out. And sure enough, he had about three chapters in his PhD dissertation that uh, have been described by many as mediocre or just ordinary uh, work, a fine work of a normal graduate student, uh, nothing groundbreaking. Um, and then one day, uh, his, his uh, roommate, his office mate, uh, uh, Bernard Carr, came back from a uh, talk that Roger Penrose had given. Uh, in London, and this really excited Stephen, and that became uh, that stimulated what would become his work on the fourth chapter of his PhD thesis, which was the one that became famous. And uh, Penrose was uh, interested in what happens when a star collapses. So, if you think about a star, why would it collapse? Well, you, you could even I think go back and say why wouldn't it collapse? Because a star is a giant ball of matter, and every bit of it is attracting pulling every other bit toward it. So you would think it would just collapse. It doesn't collapse because there are nuclear uh, energy processes going on in the star that, that create a lot of heat. And you know that hot air or hot things expand. So this, there's a balance between the gravity pulling it in and the, and the, and the heat expanding it, and it has a certain then equilibrium position of uh, you know, size. But as the nuclear fuel gets used out, uh, it starts to collapse and that can be a very violent collapse. And, and that's very chaotic. So even though a star is a nice spherical shape, um, as it collapses, inside it is very turbulent currents and stuff. And, and as it collapses, it's not quite, you're not quite sure how it's going to collapse. But what Penrose proved 
was that it collapses in a very symmetric way where everything goes down to one point at the center. And, th and this is, uh, he's using Einstein's equations of general relativity to do this analysis, not quantum equations. So that's important. So what he proved is that Einstein's theory of general relativity proves that that a star will, of certain type under certain conditions will, will collapse down to the single point and that point has no a point has no volume so that means that that's what we call singularity in mathematics that means the uh, density for example is infinite so that's a, that's a problem because uh, there that that shows that there's something wrong with the theory at that point but that's what it showed and Stephen saw that and in his usual creative kind of maverick creative turn everything on its head way said, what if we reverse that? That's like the Big Bang then, isn't it? Uh, so can we prove using similar techniques that, that, that uh, re but reversing them, that, that, that the universe started from a point and, and, and has been expanding ever since? And, and so that's what he put in his fourth chapter of his book, and then he subsequently worked out details with Penrose uh, over the next few years. So that was his first major uh, accomplishment, and it, it you know, put him on the map amongst uh, in, in theoretical physics. And then, uh, obviously, moving on from uh, from that work, he then in the seventies then moved on to looking at black holes, which is kind of I think the thing that he's the most famous for. So, could you talk about a little bit about that, and eventually what led up to to Hawking radiation, which he sort of first described in nineteen seventy four? Well, his so his next big uh, advance in the early seventies was uh, what's called the um, the laws of black hole mechanics. So that really those are four laws that um, talk about how black holes are formed, how they eat stuff, what happens, what happens if they collide and things like that. And um, so those are also, um, those are based uh, on, on general relativity, also not quantum theory. And, and he and his colleagues uh, showed what general relativity implies about how black holes behave. Um, but it's important to, I think it's important for me to say here, I keep saying it's not quantum theory to, to maybe go into that a little bit, um, so just for any any of your uh, uh, viewers who don't know that um, that we have four forces in nature. Three of them are, are the electromagnetic force and the two nuclear forces, and they're described by a quantum type theory. Quantum is really a type of theory, but it's a quantum theory of those forces, and we use those extremely successfully, let's say, at the, to describe the experiment at the Lars Hadron Collider in Geneva or other experiments in particle theory where we're examining the small-scale structure of nature, uh, electrons, protons, pions, quarks, things like that. And that works extremely well. We get uh, results to many decimal places that match the experiment. We predict things like the Higgs boson, and then we look, and sure enough, there it is. I mean, it's probably, if not the... At the, certainly at the top of the most successful theories ever in physics, even though we would consider it an, uh, an ugly theory because it takes two pages to write down and it's full of parameters you have to measure to put in, like the mass of the electron or the proton. Instead of measuring it, you have to put it in by hand and stuff like that. Anyway, but it's a quantum theory, and that means that it, 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 it's based on certain principles like the uncertainty principle that make it a quantum theory as opposed to the old Newton's way of looking at things, which was the everyday life. Now, Einstein's theory is a theory of the fourth force, gravity. It's not a quantum theory. It, it, it contradicts, it and quantum theory are contradictory. So, so um, we're trying to find a quantum version of it. We haven't done that in the, the decades that we've been looking. So, um, and that describes uh, the large scale, that describes gravitational interactions, and gravity is very weak, so the gravitational attraction between two protons is, is z basically zero for all practical purposes uh, compared to, the, say, the electron, the electric uh, attraction, electromagnetic attraction. Uh, but with a star, which is basically virtually neutral, maybe not exactly, but very close to being neutral in, in electromagnetism, has a huge amount of mass. So for stars and galaxies and stuff like that, black holes certainly, we need to use Einstein's relativity. And so that explains why we can have these contradictory theories. And for many decades, no one really worried too much about them being contradictory because uh, they're applied in different realms. It's like a biologist, one person studies uh, bacteria, another person with totally different kinds of theories might study elephants, and they don't usually have to talk to each other, you know? so. <laughs> Um, that can they can coexist, um, but this is where Stephen comes in. So, 
Uh, Stephen used general relativity in the usual way to treat those first two problems. And, and then he turned in his career to going, what about quantum theory? Uh, let's see if quantum theory, what, what quantum theory, how that changes things. And then in his next work, he went and just totally said he was wrong about those first two theories. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he needs to, and he, and when, that, when you incorporate quantum theory, uh, you get different results. Not throwing it out completely, but you have to alter the, the results somewhat. And um, first of all, I'd like to give him kudos for that because it's uh, not that common in physics that that somebody changes their mind about something or goes and disproves their earlier theorems. Um, but also uh, kudos because uh, at the time, very few people were thinking of applying quantum theory to these systems. And in fact, in that way, he led the way toward the future work in which uh, for the next few decades, it becomes more and more of a popular subject in physics to, to try and uh, find a quantum theory of gravity or even to use them together. So let me say what it means to, how do you use together two theories that are contradictory? With care. <laughs> so that, that's part of the art and the genius of Stephen and of others who, who've done that is to know how you can use bits of this and that and, and get, a, get around some of the contradictions. So I hope your viewers understand that physics is not an exact science in the sense of mathematics that we cannot solve, although we can solve almost none of our equations, almost virtually every paper in physics is a paper that uses approximations and assumptions and things that mathematicians would go, well, how do we know this is true? <laughs> you know, we can't prove that. And I know because my advisor was a mathematician, mathematical <laughs> physicist, they don't like that. But to make progress, you have to do that. So Stephen was, was doing that. And that's why it could be hard sometimes to convince people of the work and how he could get attacked like when he came up. So his first, his first application of, of that was to take quantum theory and apply it to the, to the black holes. And I can, I can get into that story if you want, but it's a long story. But let's just say he had some motivation to do that. And, and he was looking for it to go in a certain direction and it went in a different direction, which annoyed him. But he, he wasn't pig-headed enough to go, I'm not, I'm ignoring the math like some people do. <laughs> and he went where it went and he discovered Hawking radiation. And, and, and that, that made, when he first announced that, and he had a lot of guts instead of just publishing it and letting people gradually get used to it or attack him in print. He, he went, you know, in front of a conference and, and announced it, got a very hostile reception. <laughs> but of course, over the years, it's become accepted and, and mainly become accepted because people, studied what he did, and then whether they believed it or not, they would find their own way of doing it. There have been several papers after his paper which rederive it in everyone else's favorite way. There's different, everyone has their favorite way. And it's become a very widely accepted phenomenon now. So that was applying quantum theory uh, to black holes. And, um, and then in his last two major um, research programs, he, he applied quantum theory to the early universe. And so that became his no boundary proposal in the 80s and the top-down cosmology that um, that we wrote the grand design about in the 2000s. That's, it's really interesting what you say about the fact that he was prepared to go back and sort of change the theorem and, and admit that he was wrong. Um, and I don't know if anyone uh, else in the chat or if you've read uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. It's a real classic yeah. uh, in philosophy of science. And, and it, I think there's a line in there about how scientific theories don't die. It's just old scientists die and so there were people still clinging on to the ether theory of uh of <laughs> the, the that we needed an ether right up until it had been disproved so it's i think that shows i think the the intellectual you know what's the word power and, and honesty of, of stephen that he was able to go back and and admit no actually this is the way this is the way i think it is well it's, uh yeah there's a quote that's attributed to max planck which he didn't really say he, I mean, he said something in a much clunkier way plus it was in german <laughs> uh, but I read it. It's not what this says, but it's attributed to they say uh, physics advances funeral by funerals. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it was true with Planck himself. He's a good example because Planck discovered the quantum principle uh, that that energy levels are not continuous, but they come at certain only in certain steps. That's the beginning of quantum theory. But he didn't see it as a general principle of nature, nor did anyone else. And it was Einstein who first said. Quantum is a general theory of nature, and he applied it in a totally different realm than Planck had, and showed that it works there too. 
Yet in the um, about 1913 or 14, Planck was writing a recommendation for Einstein to get some prize. And he said, Einstein has done all this, this, this. He's a great physicist. And so we can use him for his, his, some of his craziness and blunders like this quantum theory stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we all know that when quantum theory changed from the way Einstein looked at it, Einstein himself couldn't accept it. And so there's a history again and again of that, of that happening. But Stephen was his own Planck and Einstein and Schrodinger. I mean, he kept revising himself, happily moving along, finding new things. So that was one of the great features. That's, that's amazing. Well, another thing, I think, I don't know if this speaks to his kind of playful nature, or he said he was kind of a bit mis mischievous, but he's also known for quite a lot of bets that he uh, put on uh, throughout his life. Um, so, uh, so I think the, the first of those was a bet with uh, Kip Thorne, who I think he had many bets with uh, throughout his life. Uh, and that, that was a bet that Cygnus X1 was not a black hole. Um, could you say a little more about that? Yeah, well, I should give some background, which, which is that when Stephen started working on black holes and the early universe in the 60s, they, they were uh, a backwater subject. Met, not many people were interested in them. Um, in fact, Richard Feynman went to a conference in Warsaw uh, on, on this stuff and wrote back to his wife that, I don't know, I think it, it makes, raises, I hate these conferences. It gives me high blood pressure. It gives me heartburn or whatever. Uh, not very many decent people working on this stuff. Uh, because there's no data. And that's the point, that back in the, in the early 60s, there were no experiments, and nor did people envision that they, that they would ever come up with any that could look back at the very beginning of the universe uh, or the very early universe or to, to, to find or and study a black hole. So they thought, well, if we can't find these things, why do the math and make predictions about what they're going to be like and study them? And yet Stephen uh, didn't see it that way. As usual, he thought differently, and he thought, well, uh, these are fascinating. The, the early universe is the beginning of everything, so I'm interested in that. And a black hole is a very um, uh, extreme object, and we can learn stuff in the laboratory of mathematics by studying it and relating it to the, also to the beginning of the universe. And so he and Penrose and some others were the ones really who took those fields from a backwater and made them like the hottest field in physics, especially when he started applying quantum uh, theory and mixing that in. Um, so black holes were very much at the heart of his research, and yet they had never been seen. And there was this candidate, Cygnus X1, that had been around for a couple of decades, and, and, and they're, they're trying to to see, you know, to find better and better evidence that it's a black hole, convincing evidence. And um, so he and Kip, that's one of his bets, and Stephen bet that it wouldn't be. And, and, and his typical reasoning, typical of Stephen, was, well, he wins either way because he bets that it wouldn't be. And it's not he wins the money or whatever he bet. I don't remember what's Kip. Um, and, and if and and on the other hand, if he has to pay because he loses, he wins in his research because aha, uh -huh, there's a black hole. So, <laughs> yeah, of course, now we know. I, I mean, um, we've found more and more evidence, stronger and stronger, and we even have a picture of one now. So uh, finally, uh, finally, we've gotten there. And in terms of the early universe, uh, just right around the time that Stephen decided to study the, these things, came the the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, the afterglow of the Big Bang that, that we now study to, to learn about the early universe. And and, um, and we've gotten better, I mean, much more sensitive uh, uh, equipment to study it, uh, better computers to analyze it. We put telescopes in space now. So um, so both of those uh, technologies caught up with, uh, you know, with, with Stephen. So it, it worked out very well. And we could also detect uh, the gravitational waves as well of uh, two black holes. Yeah. So Kip, when I was at Caltech in the early 80s, uh, uh, I got to know Kip while I was there, and he was, he just had had this beautiful idea to build the, the um, LIGO, mm. um, so the, the Laser Interferometer Gravi Gravity Observatory. Um, and um, and that, that was his, his idea was to, that we could basically, by building a huge, I mean, a very, very giant, uh, aluminum cylinders and kept the vibrations of the, as, as gravity. So gravity waves are like electromagnetic waves, except they're waves of space and time. They would distort these things. So if you build something big enough and you're sensitive enough observing it, you can maybe detect these waves. Of course, that was hopeless. But he <laughs> and it was hopeless for decades. And, and yet he got, he, I mean, he was, that was brilliant. He, he, it was a great idea. He got the money and he kept aiming in the future. So he knows well, Right now, ha ha, you know, we can't, but we're going to keep developing it as, and then, you know, as technology gets better. So mirror technology, which is very important, got better quantum detection technology and 
computer technology very importantly got better. So he later had a group kit of, 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 um, in his lab who did numerical relativity and studied numerically what, what happens when black holes are collide or black holes and neutron stars collide. Because you have to know what the theory says before you can look for the waves, right? And, and anyway, all that just kept moving forward until we, we finally detected them. And now, you know, we're detecting them routinely. So it's, um, it was, I mean, it was really amazing. Uh, I mean, that was an amazing feat because it took so many people from all over the world working for decades to get something done and to have that kind of cohesion and purpose and keep it going and keep it funded year after year for decades. Uh, that almost never happened. Just look at the, our our famous um, superconducting super collider, big billion dollar hole in Texas. <laughs> where, where we started building it and gave up after a couple of years. You know, um, so you have to give uh, uh, Kip and his colleagues a lot of uh, over the years. I've known some of the other ones too who ran it, like Jay, Jay Marks and other people. Uh, a lot of credit for keeping that going and working. Um, and Kip is very important in Stephen's life because uh, he was one of his best and closest friends, and they met in the early 70s at, at Caltech. In fact, um, yeah, so and, and Kip was important having Stephen come back to Caltech every year. So uh, there's a, a big connection there. Fantastic. So, so something I was going to ask you, um, after people have watched this talk, they'll talk to their friends and their friends go, oh, do you enjoy talking about Stephen Hawking? And they'll go, yes. And they'll go, OK, so what's talking radiation then? So I was going to ask you if you could provide a kind of simple definition of Hawking radiation. But uh, Nahom in the chat has said this, and I'm going to ask you, is this a good definition or not? Near the event horizon of a black hole, spontaneous creation of antiparticle, antiparticle couples takes place. One particle gets sucked into the black hole and the other might escape. This is how black holes slowly lose energy and emit radiation. Is that, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's one of the standard. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> so thank you to the Hom for that uh, description of yeah. radiation. So that is how black holes, even though yeah, they so seemingly suck in everything, still actually so, are able to emit radiation. Yeah, but let me talk about why that's important. Um, hmm. Because it's not just that, oh, uh, we, we thought that black holes were black and actually they're glowing because they emit radiation. What do you do? <laughs> it sounds like a, uh, a minor point, uh, but actually there's something very, very deep there. Uh, so let's see. That has to do with something that I'm sure this fellow probably has heard of called uh, unitarity. Uh, quantum theory says that, in essence, information does not get lost. Okay, so um, what is information? Well, you know, what are you, the information is what, what, what it would take to, to reconstruct you, for example. Uh, you're, you're, you're made of, you know, mostly water and some other things. But um, if I just gave people, you know, 90, whatever it is, 90% of your body weight of water and then whatever amount of calcium and da, 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 they wouldn't be able to put you together. There's a lot of information in how you're connected and what and the bonds that are between the elements and et cetera. You're organized in a certain way, right? And um, so is everything, uh, uh, you know, a carbon atom, uh, you could break it down to an electron and quarks and photons or what, you know, everything is, by, by having an identity, uh, it, it is organized in a way and it's information. So everything that has an identity has information. And, and quantum theory says that information isn't lost. That's important because it means that, that, that it has to do with the reversibility of time. Um, it means that if I tell you, your state or the state of any system at a given time, the complete state information, I can use the laws of quantum theory to, to go forward in time and tell you how it's going to develop in the future, right? We know that physics makes predictions, but I can also use them equally well to go back and tell you what, how, what the state was in the past. So it goes both forward and past, okay? And that's mathematically one of the underpinnings of quantum theory. So it's not... It's not something you can uh, talk about without drastically changing quantum theory. It's right like part of the basic, most fundamental mathematics of quantum theory. Now let's look at a black hole, okay? Take you and all that information about what you are, right? Uh, and let's say you weigh um, uh, 80 kilograms, I don't know. Uh, actually 85, for sure. <laughs> 80, 80, 85 kilograms. And, and um, all right, so I, I, I take you and I, throw you into a black hole. So, okay, quantum theory, I can follow that. I, I have you here, and you're going into a black hole, and it's fine. 
Now, when you're in the black hole, of course, you're, you're, you're detached. You're, the black hole has swallowed you up. And, and uh, so we don't know what happened to you, right? Um, so that kind of ends things in a way, okay? But, let me, but, but, but here's the thing, that the black hole does not have um, uh, any, they call it, there's a no hair theorem, they call it, but and it has no details. There's no details to a black hole. A black hole is completely described by just a few things. It's charge and it's spin, which we won't talk about now because that's just kind of esoteric. And may, but more importantly, it's mass, okay? So if I know the mass of a black hole, that's all I can know about the black hole, a mass, spin, and charge. That, that, that's all there is to know. The, 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 throwing you in versus a um, somebody else who weighs 80 kilograms or a pile of a sack of rice that weighs 80 kilograms, whatever it is that I'm throwing in loses its identity. It, it's just the black hole is that much heavier, okay? So the mass has gone up by 85 kilograms or 80 kilograms, no matter what I throw in. And there's no more details about what it was that I threw in. So that would be a problem in terms of reversing the time because not, not you know, when going forward, I have you and you're going into the black hole and you're in, and I can describe that. Going backwards, I just have the mass. There's no information about whether this was a sack of rice or or Martin. So I can't go backwards. Now, as long as a black hole stays a black hole and it's kind of detached from our universe, you can go whatever. It's detached from our universe. It was an observation. There's nothing happening. But now Stephen's saying that a black hole is radiating this Hawking radiation. So as it radiates the radiation, it, since energy is conserved, it's losing mass. It's losing its energy. The black hole is shrinking as it radiates. Okay. And at the end, in, in, in fact, it, it goes to nothing. And then it kind of explodes at the end. But whatever. We won't go into that. It just goes into nothing. Right. And, uh, so now I can, someone can ask, um, well, uh, now that the black hole is gone, I'm back to the whole universe. I can just, there's nothing, there's no part that's restricted to me any longer, right? So I, I, I can now ask a legitimate question. Uh, let's, let's start at this time after the black hole is gone, and let's look at that, whatever, that mass that we threw in, and let's go backwards and see where it, you know, let's trace everything backwards and see where it came from. We can't do that because once it went into the black hole, its identity was gone. So that's it's not reversible anymore. So that violates, we say, it violates unitarity. So that was the big paradox that uh, that the black hole um, radiation or evaporation raised, and why a lot of people were very disturbed by it. And uh, we still don't ha have an answer today. So I've noticed a lot of people in the chat. I think are getting a bit. Uh confused Boy. about i think i think i think it's it's very hard to conceptualize black holes because there's so many infinities and singularities and things so so uh, uh, just to clarify um i think some people are saying that the mass of a black hole is infinite and that's not true black holes have a distinct mass is that right Boy. correct um but so so let me just read this question again sorry um so so, so black holes have a have a finite mass but they have um what am i trying to say here a finite mass and if they're if they're spinning they could have they could have charge if they eat up charge or if they're spinning but again let's those are pretty uh let, we can ignore that they just have mass uh, but they have zero volume no uh, it depends what you mean i don't know how you define the, 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 no there's a there's a is it what's called an event horizon that's the point beyond you can't get beyond there's no return once you pass through that right the horizon of the black hole that people talk about, right? So there's a certain size, um, uh, there's a certain size to it. That's the point uh, beyond which you can't return if you if you pass that. You won't notice anything as you go past it, but um, but once you go past it, um, you can't get out. There's no way you can get out. See, so you could think of a let's think of a black hole class uh, class as a Newtonian black hole. Okay, so maybe that will help. Um, think of a sphere of mass like the Earth. Um, I don't know if maybe your viewers have heard of something called escape velocity. Um, what that means is, you know, the old adage is you throw something up, whatever goes up must come down, right? Because the earth is pulling on it, so it'll eventually pull it down. But if you throw something up hard enough, it'll have enough energy to totally escape the earth. It'll never come back down, okay? So if I throw something up at uh, 20 meters per second, it might go up, I don't know, 100 meters and come back down. Um, if I throw something up at... 200 meters per second, it might go up. I'm just pulling this out of my butt, uh, you know, 
a kilometer and come back down, whatever it is, okay? It'll eventually come back down. But if I throw it up with an, enough velocity, like 20,000 meters per second, and I'm talking about just throwing it up, it has so much speed that the pull of the earth will never bring it back down, okay? So that's called the escape velocity, and that depends on the mass of the earth, okay? The heavier the earth would be, the, the more faster you have to be going to, to escape it, right? So if it gets so dense, it can get so dense that um, that, that escape velocity is the speed of light. So that in order, in order, if Earth was dense enough, in order to escape it, you'd have to be going faster than the speed of light, okay? And since nothing goes faster than the speed of light, we would have an Earth that nothing could escape, even according to Newton, um, as long as you believe that gravity pulls on light, you know? So, um, but, um, so that that's so, so, so you can see anything that's concentrated enough mass is pulling things so hard that they can never escape its grasp, okay, unless they go faster than light. I mean, nothing can go faster than light. So that's really what a black hole is in some uh, maybe more ordinary language. Uh, I think that's they predicted in the 1700s, so or at least the, the, uh, analyzed that analysis was done in the 1700s. So uh, black holes are older than we think, and, and the, the current. Uh, modern uh, uh, analysis uh, or, you know, discussion came from Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer. And I think it was in the 40s. So I think uh, let, let's let's try and uh, finish off. I notice we've got sort of about 15, 20 minutes left. So uh, just let's try and round off the rest of Stephen's life while we're, while we're talking about it. So, so we got to kind of his work on black holes and his bets with Kip Thorne. And then, and then, like you said, his, you sort of then hinted at his later work throughout the 80s, the no boundary proposal. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so, so that's so, so. You said that was the no. Is that the no hair proposal? No, no, no. no there's is a lot different? of no this, no that. Yeah. That's that's a different. That's a different thing. Sorry. So, um, the no boundary proposal uh, is when he applied quantum theory to the early universe. So again, it um, it altered his previous picture, which was the Big Bang. And uh, what he found when you combine quantum theory with general relativity uh, is that if you go back early enough in the universe, things begin to behave very strangely. It's not, um, if you don't put in quantum theory, they, um, it, it's, um, um, you just get smaller and smaller and smaller and gets that singularity. But um, if you, if you uh, apply quantum theory, something weirder happens. And so think about this, that we know that in earlier times, the universe was smaller. And as it gets smaller and smaller, what happens, all the, matter and energy in the universe is, is compressed or condensed or at least contained in a smaller region, right? Because the universe is smaller. And uh, since uh, Einstein's theory of gravity tells you that, um, that um, matter warps space and time, you can imagine this can wreak havoc on well, our usual concept of space and time. And when you put all that together, Stephen found that, um, sorry about that, Stephen found that, <laughs> that, um, that the dimension of time ceases to behave the way we have it, the way it does today in our intuition. And it becomes more like a, 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 a dimension of space. And so that you don't really squash, ever squash down to that point singularity of the Big Bang, that things somehow get smoothed out and that goes away. And then what replaces the Big Bang uh, in that theory is, is what we call inflation, which I won't get into because then that will be another hour. But yeah. Um, there, um, and that's from comes from quantum theory, but um, but th he found that that, um, that that's what he found that that, that the Big Bang is, did not recur in that usual Einsteinian uh, description, uh, but that rather is a quantum version. And it's interesting because I, I have talked about his work on Hawking radiation and glowing terms and excuse the pun and <laughs> and, um, and and many most people consider that his best work, but Stephen told me that he considered this his best work, his work on the, the no boundary proposal in the, um, with, with Jim Hartle at UC Santa Barbara in the early 1980s. Um, so, and then uh, uh, the top-down cosmology is, is another application. It's, it's a further application of those ideas. So I uh, remember we talked about Richard Feynman before. Richard Feynman was famous for a completely new formulation of quantum theory that he developed in the 1940s. So in the in the 1920s, we finally and um, got uh, a completed uh, uh, description of uh, or working out of the of quantum theory as a cohesive, consistent theory that started with Planck and Einstein. 
and in the 1920s that got worked out in 19 i think 30 it was or it was the rocks uh made that a relative incorporate special relativity and we had that theory um and then people start applying that to atomic physics and explaining all sorts of uh, uh phenomena in atomic physics using that theory then Feynman in the 40s uh kind of turned it on his head or not really on his head but he he found a completely new seemingly unrelated but mathematically you can show equivalent uh way of looking at quantum theory using different concepts different ideas um and a totally different description and that's what is often used in cosmology and that's what steven started to apply uh to the universe in the 2000s and that that has to do in, in feynman's view uh quantum theory is this um in classical theory if you have a particle it moves on a, you know if nothing's acting on it no force it's moving in a straight line and it's going from a to b at a constant speed uh and in quantum theory says that that is not is just one of the paths that it might take and there are it can take every possible path that you can draw between point a at this time and point b at that time you connect them any way you want and it's taking all those paths now they each contribute different amounts to to the probability of it getting there it's because in quantum theory it doesn't necessarily go to b and in, in, in newton's theory something starting at a with a certain speed uh, will end up at some point b at a certain time in quantum theory that's not certain it can be many different places and to figure out the probability that it gets from a to some other place at the later time you have to take into account complex mathematics all these different paths and that will tell you the, the probability so steven said let's apply that to the whole universe so instead of a particle going all these paths we start with the universe at the beginning and we and we look at it now and and we take into what we describe it as a quantum mechanical system all these possible paths and what, what the translation of paths for a particle to histories of the universe means that there are an infinite number of different universes all with different laws of nature um, and and that take different courses and of course we are in one of them uh, but there's there's all these other ones and so he just, that's that's his theory called top-down cosmology because he says and we don't know the initial conditions so we just look at our universe <laughs> And we try and reason out what happened in the past. That's a very, it's, it's, I explain it in more detail in the book, but that's a simple explanation. The book was, we wrote not only to explain the theory, but the implications, the philosophical implications, the implications for these big questions of life. Why is the universe the way it is? How do we get here? So that's the kind of thing that we, that we answered um, in that book. But Martin, I think we should talk more about Stephen the person because I really yes. wrote book because he inspired me, not because I loved his physics, but because working with him was so uh, unusual and inspirational, taught me so much about life, so. Oh, I mean, yeah, so we've had got a few questions actually about, about sort of Stephen and his personal life and his, and his sort of views on various things. So maybe I'll put a few of those to you actually, that might be nice. Um, so I think one of, one of the things that must have been, what am I trying to say, that, that obviously Stephen thought about a lot during his life, was the fact that he was working on these big fundamental questions of what is nature what is the universe how you know how what are the laws of nature how did they come about these these really really fundamental questions and of course that then puts him into i wouldn't say conflict but it's in a similar territory to the philosophers and a similar territory to the to the religious people as well so um Garth Wilkinson asked in the Theory of Everything film, he said uh, to his wife that cosmology is theology for atheists. Um, is it true that he said that? Or, or even if he didn't say it, do you think that sort of summarizes his view of cosmology? Uh, you know, I don't know if he said that. Uh, <laughs> he even said that the, that the film was broadly true. And by, <laughs> by that he meant, uh, I think the details were not necessarily accurate, but the, you know, the gist. <laughs> And um, I never asked him if he actually said that. Now, would I think that he thinks that uh, theology, it, it, cosmology, well, cosmology is cosmology theology. is theology for atheists was the quote. I mean, yeah, it depends how he meant it. Um, I, in some ways, I think he would never say something like that because um, cosmology, um, theology is is. Um, Based on faith, and, and uh, so cosmology is is something based on um, on observation and mathematics. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you look at maybe a little deeper at the questions that you ask, um, theology asks the question, the same questions: Why are we here? Where do we come from? And answers it in one way. 
and cosmology answers it another way. So in that sense, I could see, I could see him saying that. I don't know if he said that. So sorry. <laughs> That's an interesting follow-up, actually. Let me say that Stephen was an atheist, but made a point. Told me uh, that he, you know, that he didn't want to, didn't really want to say that. He didn't want to insult anybody. He, and in our book, we didn't, we never argued for atheism. We, we would argue that, for example, in the grand design, that you didn't need God to create the universe that it could arise from nothing. We did never said that there's this shows that there's no God uh, or you know there's evidence for God. We just said that that um, that it's not necessary. This is what the physics tells us. And I know he went to church with Elaine and uh, later with Diana. So and I, I don't know. I guess he did with Jane as well. I don't I don't remember. But but uh, he he was you know not anti uh, religion. And he specifically told me he didn't want to be seen that way. He didn't want to be like Richard Dawkins. Uh, and 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 campaign against religion. So that's important. There's a, there's a really interesting follow-up question actually from uh, someone called Augusta, who says, "I work in Westminster Abbey and often show visitors Stephen's memorial. What would they want me to say about him or tell them? How did he feel about the plans to have his ashes interred there?" Um, I, I think he he felt very honoured, um, as he did about all his you know acolytes, um, and that uh, I mean he. He wasn't. A, it's funny because he wasn't a big fan of Isaac Newton, but uh, but he appreciated what he did. I mean, as I said in the book, Newton was was, was kind of an ass. I think when I talked to Stephen about he he wasn't happy. I thought Newton wasn't a nice guy, but but um, no, I think he was very. He, he appreciated all his honors that he got, and and when he was alive, he he used them to uh, promote his passion of science and, and the scientific approach. The the idea that. We should make evidence-based uh, decisions and uh, and theories, and we should believe, you know, the, the met scientific method and what science does. And he really is trying to promote uh, the understanding of science, um, as well as one other. I think he was very passionate about promoting uh, disabled rights. So I think those two uh, two things. I mean, well, if you look, if I can just say something about what his life was like. Oh, um, sure. I mean, I, you know, when I first got to Cambridge to work with him. Uh, I, I, you know, I felt bad for him. I, I remember the, the first time in his office. I write about that in the book, where, where I see a bead of sweat going down down his uh, forehead, and he, you know how that tickles, and, and I would just wipe it away. But he can't do that, right? He has to sit there and take it. I thought it was like Chinese water torture. I mean, maybe his um, carer will notice it and wipe it up, but I mean, he has to get used to that. He he, and that that was just one little element of something happening for one second of that day um you know when he when he's eating he, he could still move his mouth a little bit but he had everything cut up for him and you know it was it was not a way most of us would like to eat and then a lot of it's falling out and um i mean it, it's like his his life was hardship after hardship if he's reading something uh he had some something for a while there was something that would turn pages for him but everything was very clunky he was talking six words a minute through tedious typing um, at night when he's laying in bed he can't turn like you do right he can't turn to a new position they would his carer who you'd have a carer every night um, would turn him periodically but he you know if you wake up and you feel like turning you can't and later in life his bones really hurt him and it's just his life for for an ordinary person could have been looked at as just one torture after after another or just not being able to get your ideas out or breathing through the stoma, which is the hole in his chest. And it gets clogged sometimes and you can't get air and they have to unclog it. But that feeling that you can't get the air, I mean, there are so many things. And, and but, then I, I, but I soon stopped feeling sorry for him because I, I, I realized that he had taken control of his, of his mind, of his, of his life. Uh, you know, the Stoics said, the ancient Stoics, that happiness, true happiness comes really just from within. It's not the things around you. It's not even the people around you. It's, it's inside you. And if it's inside you, then no one can take it away. If someone can't, you know, uh, someone can't disappoint you or um, losing a possession or whatever it is because you're in control of your mind. And Stephen, I think, really embodied that. You know, I think that it wasn't that he would wait uh, he got used to waiting for someone to wipe the drop off or that the drop would eventually fall off. He said he got used to not minding, right? And, and um, the same thing with all the other hardships because he was just an amazing person in that he he endured all these things that 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 we, we wouldn't. 
uh, endure, uh, you know, it was number one, gave me perspective when I would have a problem. I would look at, you know, on the scale of one from one is not so much of a problem to uh, I can't even move, which is Stephen's situation. All my problems were pretty close to one, you know, and I would realize that. But if they weren't, I would also realize that I can overcome that being a problem by my attitude, not necessarily by, you know, there's things I can't control, but I can control my attitude. So I learned those things from him, and he managed to face life with such a um, energy, uh, joie de vivre, joie de vivre, I speak German, not French, sorry, so uh, joy of life, you know, uh, enthusiasm for life, sense of humor. Uh, it, was, it was really amazing to, to, to watch that, and he was an amazing person. I think someone said in the chat, but I can't find the comment now. That, um, but you know, what, what would be the thing that you would say to students to kind of take inspiration from him? But it sounds like his his stoicism and his positivity and his sort of, you like you say, his lust for life were probably the main things more than even his scientific achievement. Yeah, and he, I mean, he applied that that enthusiasm and that adventurous spirit too to science. I mean, that's why he could investigate things that other people thought were wild or you know uninteresting, or you know why he could. He was not only open to proving himself wrong, he was happy in some ways because he understood more. So, so um, there's a story in the book also about Zeldovich, another physicist who was involved in Stephen's early um, work on the um, black hole radiation. Zeldovich had looked at the similar things for spinning black holes. And, and, um, and Zeldovich, however, ironically, um, was one of those who was the last to, to, to uh, accept Stephen's work, to believe it. And, and, um, and then when he finally found that his calculus said Zeldovich, that he had made a mistake in his calculations and his own way of looking at it also reproduced Stephen's work. <clears throat> Instead of resisting that or being pissed or anything, he was, he was uh, joyful that, 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 that now he understood it. And I think Stephen, when he's proving himself wrong, was joyful that, 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 that he finally understood it. That he loved, you know, understanding nature. So uh, that was one of his... Um, you know, stronger points for as a, as a scientist. As a, a, an interesting question here from uh, Natalia, um, which is, when did Stephen know that his name was now part of pop culture? And he, he must have had a really interesting attitude to celebrity because, of course, you don't become a physicist to become famous, but he was probably one of the most, if not the most disabled person on the planet and certainly one of the most famous scientists as well. So well, how, I, how did this attitude change? Yeah, that's why I want to kind of also in the book, but but but, but um, it's an interesting story of how a brief history of time got written, hmm. and I'll give you a let's see a few highlights. But I mean, he was um, there was a, a fellow at Cambridge University Press who wanted Stephen to write a um, a book for them, which would, if you don't know the um, academic press world, it's um, it's a different world than the popular science book world. Uh, they tend to be very technical. They sell a few thousand copies, and that's no marketing, not much editing, and that's it. And um, that's how it started out and through a very interesting chain of events that I won't get into. Uh, it got changed to, no, it's, it's now Bantam, a big U.S. publisher, uh, who sees it as a big book for them because they were publishing um, uh, less intellectual books and they wanted to make it get more serious. So they picked him. They paid him 10 times what Cambridge was going to pay him <laughs> as an advance. And, and uh, they gave him a brilliant editor, Peter Guzzardi, who helped quite a bit with the book. And, um, and, you know, still, they didn't expect it to be what it was. I mean, the advance was $250,000, and it was, it was a lot in the mid-'80s, but it wasn't millions. And um, and then the book, I mean, then I, I think it didn't take him long to see that he was going to be a celebrity because the, the book just, like, blew up. And, um, you know, everyone was reading it or buying it, at least. <laughs> and um, and I, I, he, he, you know, he he enjoyed that because he, he I, think, uh, I think he enjoyed – being a spokesman for physics. And again, he, he was a big advocate for, for science. And I think he used that, uh, you know, he, he, he enjoyed that. And also for his disability, there's stories in the book about how he was treated. It's amazing before he's famous. <laughs> I mean, one of them where he's being pushed down Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, one of his visits to Caltech and some guy walking by sees, sees you know, the way he's sitting, assumes that because he's physically disabled, he must be mentally disabled and a derelict and just throws $10 at him. I mean, it's like, you know, um, it's amazing how people look at disabled people sometimes. So um, so I think he used his celebrity in, in those ways. And, you know, I think sometimes it, it was annoying to him um, because nobody wants to be followed around or whatever. But 
you know, when we were walking, uh, I remember one, one, one time sticks out in my mind. We were walking in, um, I forget if it was Cambridge or Pasadena, and, and um, it, was, it, was, it had been a long night, and he was very tired. I think he'd even been falling asleep, and we were walking um, back to his house or you know, either here or there, and um, somebody on the street saw him and came up to him and asked, you know, wanted a picture with him. And uh, his care, oh, no, he's really tired. He's exhausted. I'm sorry. And you could tell from his face like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. And he was so generous with always, you know, letting people take pictures with him. And, um, you know, even no matter how many times he was stopped or, or how tired he was. So, uh, you know, and he, he was, he was a rock star. Um, and, but he was a kind one. And, um, you know, I remember in the Frankfurt Book Fair, well, after Reefer History was published, or maybe right before uh, we went there, and uh, I'd never been in anything like that before. I mean, uh, it was like he was a rock. I mean, you know, there's all these authors milling about, and then there's Stephen with, you know, 20, you know, cameramen with uh, videos and stills and flashes going off, and it's like crowds around. I mean, it was like a rock star. Um, yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm walking with, with a rock star. <laughs> Like, who? Yeah, I mean, who would expect that? Um, knowing Einstein's equations would, would make anyone interested in you, but okay. <clears throat> I mean, I, I saw him myself a couple of times. I never actually got to speak to him, um, but I because I went to Cambridge twenty odd years ago, um, and yeah, you'd see him occasionally, just like going down King's Parade or something, and it'd be exciting. You get a tingle of excitement that you've just seen like an absolute, you know, legend, um, you know, yeah. real celebrity. It was, it was definitely, definitely uh, exciting. Yeah, yeah, he used to, and in the early days, I mean, he, he I remember um, he would, you know, cross at, at the street when he could still roll his wheelchair at strange places and times and almost get hit, say people noticed him for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was another question here. Someone, someone I've, I've kind of lost who said it now, um, but uh, someone asked about, about was there anything really funny that he said? Because I think he did also have a reputation of being quite a funny man as well as being so. Yeah, so he was. I mean, there were a few, I mentioned, um, well, here's one is that um, uh, one story was that I was um, I had a, a, a near near death experience. I had a massive internal bleeding at some point here in uh, Pasadena. And um, and uh, when I went back on my next visit, when, when we were talking about after dinner one time. Um, and uh, you know, I told him that when I was laying in bed and the doctors were saying, oh, he's going might bleed out tonight. And I'm you know, like, I said, uh, yeah, they, 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 that doctor flunked bedside manner 101 in medical school, right? Um, but, um, you know, I was thinking, oh, my God, how ironic it is that I might die before we finish the book and not him, you know? Because <laughs> people were always going, oh, what if he's, you know, and Stephen, I have to say, endured so many near-death experiences. I mean, that's why it was so, it was, like, fascinating to me because, um, you know, he had a lot of lung infections, and then so many times I thought this might be the last one. So I was talking to him about that because I know he had gone through that feeling many times. Um, and I said at some point, um, we should make a bet on, on, on who dies first. And he said, no, I don't want to or something like that. And I said, why not? He said, because the loser won't be around to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was amusing and also very logical. I, why hadn't I thought of that? <laughs> So, uh, so uh, we've still got still got a few more minutes. Uh, I'll try I'll try and cram in a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, a few people are asking. I've, again, I've lost the question. Sorry about this. Um, we're asking about: is, Are there any things that he predicted that we still don't know, or is there any kind of unfinished work that he left, or is, is oh, there yeah. anything? Is, uh, yeah, both his uh, um, no boundary proposal and his um, top down cosmology still need to be. Um, they're just their theories now, but they they're you know the. Evidence for them would come from a, 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 a more detailed study of that cosmic microwave background radiation that I mentioned earlier that, that is beyond the scope of current technology. So, so right now, those last two research programs of his uh, are, 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 are theories, but they haven't been um, uh, verified. In fact, neither has Hawking radiation for that. <laughs> I mean, think that yeah. Uh, so when you're working in, in those fields, um, a lot of the work is theoretical, and people either, you know, can grow to believe it or they can attack it. But but it's all mathematical. Um, so let's look at the black hole radiation, for example. That that is a very uh, that radiation is what radiation has a temperature associated with it, 
And it's and for most black holes, it's very small temperature. Uh, well, I don't know, a millionth of a degree or something like that, far less than the 2.7 degrees of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So it's really swamped by that. So even if we see a black hole, um, and even if we see one that's close enough that we get pretty good data on it, uh, the chances are slim that we'll detect the radiation that way. Uh, also, uh, you know, the idea of black hole shrinking takes uh, the black holes, most black holes uh, that we know of, which, uh, or, the, or the masses that we expect and or we see, um, would take longer than the, uh, than the lifetime of the universe to evaporate. So that's a theoretical thing. It's not something that's happening. I mean, the hope would have been with these pro so-called primordial mini black holes where everything would happen hotter and faster uh, if we could find those. And there was some hope that that might have showed up in the uh, Large Hadron Collider, but it, but it didn't. And there's some other uh, evidence, uh, some other experiments they were doing astronomically also didn't turn them up. So it looks like they don't exist. But so so that is also a, a, a you know a theory that that has not been uh, uh, verified. The closest we've come to it is uh, what's called a a, a sonic analog, which means uh, it was noticed by a, a famous uh, brilliant physicist named Unruh some years ago, decades ago, that that actually under certain circumstances, fluids in the laboratory can um, um, can play the role of a black hole. We can study them, and the mathematics uh, of what's happening is, is analogous to a black hole. What you do is you take a very cold fluid um, and you flow it, and sound has a so so there are there are there are certain let's say quantum particles of sound that we can describe in a, in a fluid of uh, that nature, and sound has a certain speed in a fluid. It's not the same as the speed in, in a vacuum, but it has a speed in the fluid. And uh, here's what you can do. You can, you have a fluid that's moving uh, faster than the speed of sound for that fluid, and, and one of these particles of sound gets emitted um, in the backward direction, it can't escape because um, it, the, the, the fluid is moving faster than the speed of sound in that fluid. So it's just still moving forward. So that's kind of like a, a black hole. And so people have actually done in Israel an experiment uh, like that, and they've actually uh, found some evidence that what Stephen is describing is actually happening. Again, it's not the, it, it, it's a little bit indirect. Um, but the reason, uh, but, but I mean, you know, it, it, it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's convincing and an important evidence. And as I said, the reason that the people treat Hawking radiation as if it's real is because by now many people have taken many different approaches and always come up you know with the same answer which is that he was right so it's more of a theoretical thing and that's why by the way no one asked but that's why he didn't get a Nobel Prize because to you know he has had, he had a lot of influence on physics uh, he he as I said he 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 brought he made the beginning of the universe and black hole theory respectable and and, and made some of the most significant pioneering steps in combining gravity and quantum theory and um, has done many, many important things. Um, but since there was not solid uh, uh, concrete experimental confirmation, uh, then they will not give a Nobel Prize for that because they, the Nobel Committee gives Nobel Prizes only to things that are experimentally confirmed, or at least we think they are. Sometimes it turns out to have been wrong. Um, and in fact, what's really annoying about them is that they'll often give it uh, to when they give the Nobel Prize for that uh, uh, theory or phenomenon, they give it to the experimentalists who who confirmed it, not to the theorists who predicted it. So that could happen too. <laughs> so if there were these three three uh, physicists who finally measured Hawking radiation from a black hole, they could have got. You know, only three can get it. They might have gotten the Nobel Prize and not Stephen. So. And also, you can't win the Nobel Prize uh, posthumously. Oh, either, so. I mean, while he was alive, exactly. You can't, yeah. you so he'll ne so unfortunately he'll never win the Nobel yeah, Prize, which is very sad. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so kind of silly, anyway. In a way, the you know the. Uh, on the one hand, I think it's silly. On the other hand, I think we're not very good markers because um, the Academy Awards are just as silly, but it's such a big spectacle, and it, and, and, and it brings so many people's interest to movies when it comes right. Why don't we have the, uh, why, you know, I think we should have the Nobel Prizes the same way. I, you know, don't <laughs> have all these people come in fancy gowns and sit there with uh, 
celebrity scientists uh, and I don't know, song and dance, whatever, <laughs> make a big show out of it. And, and uh, at least, you know, get some PR out of it, but we don't do that. <laughs> but also I think it's, it's interesting. I think the parallel is quite interesting really, because of course the Oscars, really do reward a certain kind of film and if you're you know a brilliant comic actor or you've made a brilliant horror film those full sorts of films just never get recognized the Oxers. and it feels to me that's the parallel with theoretical physicists um and i'm just trying to think of any other so well, obviously maths there is no nobel prize for maths so there are these other areas of science that that like the uh, academy uh the nobel committee also don't uh, seem to recognize achievements in certain fields yeah they, they, yeah they definitely have to have their bias uh they have a definite bias and, you know, and, you know, the, the idea that, I mean, that you can quantify or give a, your number one. And, you know, uh, I, I just think that's, that's kind of silly. You know, it's like, you know, apples, oranges, pears, mangoes, who's number one. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I promised I would try and uh, try and wrap this up uh, reasonably soon, but I've just got, I've just got uh, a final question that I think would be, really interesting to answer it kind of goes back to the science as well as as well as well as stephen's life so obviously the name of the film that was made i'm sure many people have seen was called the theory of everything and now stephen and nobody has yet come up with a final definite theory of everything that incorporates like you were saying about the start the the three forces that are described by quantum and the gravitational force that's described by general relativity so so i guess it's a two-part question part one is what do you think Stephen Hawking thought was kind of the best candidate for a theory of everything? Was it string theory, M theory, some of the different ones out there? And I guess, where do you now um, in 2020 see that theory of everything going? Do you think we'll ever come up with one or do you think it's it's sort of beyond beyond our understanding? Well, Stephen believed in M theory and, and M theory is not different from string theory. It's kind of an outgrowth or a a uh, successor you know it's it's a kind of string theory it's a um, general string theory 2.0 string theory like, that's perfect string theory 2.0 uh, he, he believed that uh that's what we wrote about in the grand design as i you said in our analysis um now um th th since then it's been 10 years since the book came out and and uh 15 years since we started writing the book uh, i think steve till the end believed in m theory but i have to say that uh, and, and, and I know I would catch some flack from certain quarters <laughs> saying this, that, that um, uh, string theory slash M theory, it, it seems to be in trouble. The last really major advance uh, revolution, you know, big jump was in like the mid nineties. Uh, uh, it's been worked on since the seventies and um, it, there doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, it's they're learning a lot of useful mathematics. They're using it to to illuminate some phenomena in other areas of physics and solid state physics, which is not was not what it was designed for. Or even in quantum field theory, which they people just wanted to replace with it. it it's t teaching us a lot of different lessons, but it doesn't seem to be getting to toward any making any progress toward that theory of everything. And I mean, as, as I said earlier, um, quantum theory took twenty five years to thirty years to to really become mature, but this has been going for 40 years. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot more physicists working on physics now than there was in the, you know, 1900. So um, I don't know. Uh, most physicists, I think, that I've talked to uh, are very skeptical about string theory, except for those who work on, work on it. it. <laughs> so uh, it seems like everybody who isn't skeptical is working on it, or I, I don't know. But um, who knows? I, 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 I don't know. Um, if there is a unified theory, uh, I, I think that uh, I would like to think two, two things. One is that the standard model isn't the final word because I, I wish I, when I give talks on it, I, I have a great slide where I show the standard model. It's two dense pages of equations and words and, you know, off the wall definitions. <laughs> I mean, it's like crazy. And then I show Einstein's equation, which is like one line with a few terms. That's the equation that we like in physics. Okay. <laughs> Einstein's equation. It was just a very simple thing like like Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared. It looks like that a little bit. Uh, contains so much information about how the universe formed, how black holes formed, and what happens when they collide. And you know, and it contains all of Newton's laws in it too. If you, if you look at the if you look at the realm in which um, uh, relativity is not important, it reproduces Newton's laws. I mean, it's an amazing one line packed with you know meaning. 
Uh, and it takes a lot of study to understand what it means, but the fact that you can write it in one line shows that it's coherent and has a unity to it. And it can all be, you know, encapsulated uh, idea. Now, you look at the quantum theory of the other forms of nature, and it looks like uh, like some engineer's design for a circuit board or something. I mean, it's like, it's like it's like what we know about life, right? It's like it's like a genome or something. It's like a bunch of facts and information with not very much coherent um, unifying, uh, you know, principle. There's just too many, but this except for that. Oh, oh, by the way, this. I mean, it's like crazy. And we would like the other kind of theory for that. So that's the first thing we would like from a unified theory. And then, of course, we want to make gravity a quantum theory. So we want to make the standard model simpler or let's say deeper so that we know the simple, we know the basic uh, fundamentals and we don't need all that stuff. We can just derive that from the simple thing. That's number one. Number two, we want to make Einstein's equation quantum. And number three, we want to put them together and have the theory of everything. That's what we want. Um, that's based on human aesthetics. It's not based on anything else. <laughs> uh, I talked to Richard Feynman and it was, was a famous opponent of, of, of this idea. Uh, Einstein was, by the way, at the end of his career, a famous proponent of that idea. He wanted that, he, not the quantum part. He thought we would figure out how to get rid of quantum. So he wouldn't, he didn't think we'd make relativity quantum. He thought we'd make the other stuff not quantum, but whatever. <laughs> he wanted this united thing. He called it a unified field theory. And he was very isolated at the end of his life. And there's a great quote that I can never remember, but it basically says that other physicists, younger ones now, this is toward the end of his life, look at me as a, you know, outmoded dinosaur uh, working on stuff that doesn't matter and is going nowhere. And that's fine with me, he basically said. <laughs> and then he died, I think, 54 or 55. And, and, and um, largely due to Stephen's work in the, in the, by the 70s, that became, pop, started to become popular again, really by the 80s. So it took a few decades. And now we're looking for that theory of everything or unified theory again. Um, but Feynman, in the, I, when I was there, in this, I was at Caltech, um, when I was there in the, in the 80s, a guy named John Schwartz is one of the pioneers of string theory, was, was working on it very early when most people didn't even know about it or believe it. And, you know, it has all these extra dimensions and stuff. And Feynman would kind of make fun of him because, uh, uh, you know, Feynman goes, well, we don't live in 11 or 26 dimensions or whatever he was doing at the time. And he would say, how many dimensions are you in today, John? You know? So, so he ridiculed that because he wanted to be closer to reality. He didn't want to have a theory with 11 dimensions that you have to then explain away, you know, seven of them or whatever. But, um, but Feynman told me, he said, you know, these people who are looking for the unified field theory, you know, I, I, I don't believe in that because um, I think that that aesthetic that they have, you know, is misguided because we physicists, it's not our role to tell nature what the theory is. It's nature's role to tell us what the theory is. So if it's the standard model, it's the standard model, and don't get bent out of shape because it's, you think it's ugly and so forth. And if there's <laughs> two separate theories, then there's two, two separate theories, and just follow what nature dictates. So there's different, you know, approaches. But Stephen was one who, who, who wanted the beauty. <laughs> That's well, such an interesting point, isn't there? That, that we're, as humans, we're naturally drawn to simple, clear theories and beautiful theories. And, and like you say, Feynman was to reject all that and said, no, nature's messy and weird. And, and we shouldn't just because the theory looks neat doesn't mean it's true. Um, and so, I guess it's such an interesting tension in science. Um, and in fact, just to, just to kind of finish on, on that note, you were talking about the, the beauty and simplicity of obviously equals MC squared. And Stephen himself actually has a formula on his. Uh, on his gravestone. I don't know if you'd like to tell people a little, little bit about that. Well, that, that's a long, uh, but that, that goes back to um, his discovery of Hawking radiation and the entropy of a, of a, of a, of a black hole. Um, I need that guy who gave that one sentence explanation. So <laughs> it, um, the, the people, when, when Stephen came up with his laws of black hole physics, they were uh, analogous people know very closely and weirdly mysteriously analogous to laws in another completely unrelated, seemed thought to be unrelated field of physics called thermodynamics. So there was a zero, the first, second, third law, and they were in black hole and also thermodynamics. And there was one person named Bekenstein, Jakob Bekenstein, who um, took that seriously and thought that that meant something. Stephen did not. 
And that's one of the things, really the main thing that guided Stephen toward his research that would lead to the, to the Hawking radiation. And, he, and that involved saying that black holes have a certain entropy, which is a concept from thermodynamics. And Stephen found that actually, he was trying to prove Bekenstein wrong, but he proved he was right. And he was annoyed, but he admitted it, and he went much farther in, 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 in deriving this black hole radiation. So that's what he wanted on his uh, uh, resting place.